a dream. There's so many people, they have a question about God, they doubt, and the church says, you can't doubt, and so they leave the church. The enemy wants you to exclude God, and God says, leave it. Start doing what you already know is God's will. He doesn't see your big mess up. What he sees is Jesus. Lord, I have nothing, but I trust in you. My hope is in you. God has a plan for your life. Hey, good morning. Welcome to all of our campuses, all of you watching online, uh, all of us here. Man, this is a good weekend, isn't it? Baseball season, uh, the Masters, uh, the Stars are in the, I think they're going to playoffs. The Mavs are definitely going to the playoffs, and the Cowboys are slotted to win the Super Bowl this next season. So I feel it. I feel this is the year. <laughs> hey, speak those things into existence, right? Let's use that out of context. All right, so... Uh, a couple things before I dive into the message. Um, <clears throat> first thing is men's conference. Guys, um, May the 6th, it's Friday. I think it's from like 6 to 10 or whatever, just a one-night deal. Guess, man, we got some great speakers. Tony Evans, Dr. Tony Evans is going to be on this stage preaching the gospel at our men's conference. I am so excited. He is a legend. If you don't know Tony Evans, you need to get saved. Right? I mean, he's that. I mean, everybody knows Tony. So sign up. If you, and listen, I understand if you are maybe new, maybe you're new to Hope, whatever campus you go to, we're all going to be at this campus. And, and it's, it, you know, it's one thing to come with your family and, you know, you have somebody sit by. And I understand you may not have real deep connections or any connections at all here at Hope. I just want to encourage you, uh, maybe invite a friend uh, that you know, a neighbor, a coworker, a son to come with you, and if not, I, I feel like you're gonna have some, uh, some opportunities to maybe make some connections. Um, so the conference is gonna be not only great for connections, but it's more about this, too. It's always about this, but it's always about you connecting with the Lord, and I think it's gonna be a great night. So sign up for that, and maybe bring a friend with you. Now, Good Friday is this Friday, this is Holy Week, and, and uh, we started this tradition a few years ago. and. <laughs> the first time we did it, honestly, quite honestly, we were expecting, a, a, I don't know, we just did it at one campus. We we're expecting three or 400 people to show up. This place was packed. Parking was a mess, and it, everybody was mad. Good Friday was not Good Friday. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so here's what we're asking you to do. Um, we ask you to go and reserve RSVP. Just, we have two services here at East. All campuses are coming together, and, and these, are, these are big services. Um, RSVP, so, we have a, so you have a good experience, but more importantly, our guests that may come that day, maybe you invite a guest, and you want them to have a good experience. So uh, if you could, do us a favor, 12 noon, 6.30 p.m. this Friday. Powerful service. Really, um, it's, it's good for us to, to think about the price that Jesus paid. So that's Good Friday. Now, Saturday and Sunday, Resurrection Weekend, uh, we need you to RSVP for that, same reasons, and I know some of you grew up, you know, I didn't have to make a reservation to go to church. This is ridiculous. You can have that attitude, or you can say, hey, I love Jesus, and I'm going to reserve my spot. <laughs> all right? You can do whatever one you want, all right? But it helps us, and it, and it helps our guests, of course. And, you know, I invite a friend. I invite, a, if, well, more than just one, but I invite friends every time. I invite, when I ask you to invite somebody, I invite somebody. So... Um, that somebody may come, and we want them to have a good experience, right? And we want them to have, it's, it's great. So I know it, and during Easter and, and, and services like Christmas Eve, people have the designated service they want to go to, but most people do. They want to come on Sunday mornings at 9.30, between 9.30 and, and 12, and if everybody came at that time period, it would not be resurrection weekend in your heart. You know, you'd be mad again. So we want to do that. We want to solve that. And so if you could RSVP, that'd be great. Um, last thing, Prosper Campus. We, we had a groundbreaking this past Thursday. And if you were upset because you weren't invited, we didn't invite anybody, okay? There's no parking on this campus right now. And on Prosper Trail, it's a two-lane road. There is no parking. So we just did it without you. But I know you were there in spirit. So... We had a great time, and in the next few days, we hope to be breaking ground for real. They said I could, I could drive the bulldozer for a little bit, so I'm excited about that, and those of you know, we've been raising money for this. End of last year, we started, and our goal is to pay this, for, pay this off in cash, 
So um, what we need to do is give. And so thank you for the first quarter of this year, half a million dollars over and above our regular giving was the goal. We raised over 600,000 for our first uh, quarter. So that's like a, a good thing. So yeah, okay, good. So every, every, every so often we're gonna, we have these quarterly goals. And, and so hopefully uh, by the end of the two years, and if not, maybe three, we'll pay this thing off, all right? So good, thank you for being faithful. All our campuses and all of you watching online, thank you for being faithful and giving. It really does uh, help us not just achieve our goals, but it helps us uh, win people to Jesus. I mean, that's what it's all about. Today, week three of You've Heard It Said, um, Palm Sunday. Over the last few weeks, uh, we're borrowing a phrase from the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, you've heard it said, don't be, or don't commit murder, I say unto you, don't even be angry. And he, he goes through a six list of things where he says, I've, you've heard it said, we're borrowing that phrase and visiting some of the important phrases that Jesus used in his teachings. And the first week, we talked about, you must be born again. Last week, Pastor Eric from our McKinney campus, shout out, man, he did awesome. I watched it twice. Great job. He talked about, my yoke is easy, but my burden is light unpack that for us. And what does that mean to us? Today, you've heard it said, the rocks will cry out. This is, again, Palm Sunday, a very noted uh, Sunday on the Christian calendar for thousands of years. And it still is an important Sunday, Palm Sunday. But what does that mean? If you grew up in church, many of you knew that you know, maybe you had a palm branch or you had palm branches or maybe you had a larger church and a donkey actually walked in your church and you were all excited because it was awesome. Um, what is Palm Sunday and what was that whole thing about? The, the story is in a couple of the Gospels, but Luke chapter 19 is where we're going to be. And let's talk, let's unpack this because what does it mean to us, this Palm Sunday? And you've heard it said, the rocks will cry out in one translation. What, what did Jesus mean by that? Well, let's, let's look at it. Luke chapter 19. After telling this story, he told the story, by the way, in, in the first part of chapter 19. He said, I'm telling you this story so that you understand that the physical kingdom of God is not going to happen right now. He actually says that. He I tell you that, well, he doesn't say that. Luke says that and writes that and says, he told this story so that they would know that the kingdom, the physical kingdom, was not going to happen right away. Keep that in your mind for just a minute. That's the story he just told. Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them, and as you enter, you will see a young donkey tied there that has never been ridden. After telling, the, uh, untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road, another gospel will say palm branches. I think it was both, probably. On, on the road ahead of him. And when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And he replied, if they, keep, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers, or in a trans, I think it's King James, the rocks will cry out. Several things about this story. But as Jesus completes this part of the story, he says, the rocks will cry out. That's an interesting statement, and yet for them, not so much uh, they've never heard it before because the Old Testament has plenty of passages where all creation worships the Lord. Isaiah chapter 55 says it this way, 
You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song, and the trees of the field will clap their hands. This is nothing new to the Jewish faith. Psalm 148 says it like this, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him from the skies. Praise Him all His angels. Praise Him all the armies of heaven. Praise Him sun and moon. Praise Him all you twinkling stars. Praise Him skies above. Praise Him vapors high above the clouds. Let every created thing give praise to the Lord, for He issued His command and they came into being. He set them in place forever and ever, and His decree will never be revoked. There, there's this idea that all creation... All creation, all created beings, us, the trees, the hills, will worship. And the religious leaders just didn't quite understand. They, they were very worried about his claim to be deity. It was blasphemy to them. And as the crowds are shouting, blessed is he, or Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Worship. We wor in other words, we worship you. This was unsettling to them because there were some things going on in their world. It's an all creation, all in kind of worship. Romans chapter 12, Paul says it like this in verse one. And so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. All, in other words, all your life. Everything you are, you give to God. Lift up, put it on the altar because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This, listen to this. This is truly the way to worship him. Now, let's put it all together. And as the people were singing, putting their garments, putting their palm branches, he's riding in on this colt. Praise the Lord. They were excited for what was getting ready to happen. And incidentally, in John's gospel, Right before the triumphal entry, he has just raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, this was one of the most notable miracles, and, and this was, I mean, the height of Jesus' popularity. Lazarus was dead for three days, and he called him out of the tomb, and Lazarus comes walking out. Unbelievable miracle. All of us in this room would be amazed, as they were amazed. So when it says, they were excited about all the miracles. That, that We're just coming off of raising somebody from the dead. So when we, we think of this worship and this praise and this all creation and all in kind of thing, I, I want to help us understand the, the whole concept of worship. And the, the, the rocks will cry out and Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What, what does this mean, worship? I'm gonna, it helps me to get visuals, so I hope this helps you. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, worship is our lives. So many of us designate worship to be the singing time. The, we come to church and, and we sing, and that, of course, is worship. But I want you to understand that worship is far more than singing. Now, there are many ways or many <clears throat> uh, ways that I could divide this like a pie. This is our life, and we offer up our life, which means all of us. So this really helped me to understand when I'm, when I'm thinking of worship, and, and just we, maybe we think of one or two things, but, but there's, it's all of us. So, so it's our time that we spend with him, reading of Scripture, praying, journaling, it's that time in which we spend with him that is a part of our worship. It's, it's, and maybe some of you don't do that a ton, but when you do, it's a part of worship. It's that, that secret place, Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It's that understanding when Jesus, many, many times, they couldn't find Jesus and he would be alone in the wilderness. He would be alone somewhere praying. It's that time with the Lord that is a part of our lives, and it's a part of our worship. Maybe another part would be money. That every time we give, it is a worship unto the Lord. It's, it's, it's an understanding, it's a recognition that, that every good gift comes from the Father, so that it's not because you're so talented or gifted or even lucky. It's because 
God has blessed you. You don't even have breath without him, much less a paycheck. And so our worship in giving, and many of us, man, this is a hard one for us, and that's okay. We're going we're gonna to talk more about it, but it, it's a, a worship to him. Now, this one's a familiar one. Maybe it's our song, and of course it's our song. Now, many of us love this part. Man, we get here early. We're like, yes. John, I wish you'd, man, this, this church needs to wake up. I just, I just had somebody, uh, you know, te- uh, message me and say our church was dead. And, and I was like, I, I totally get it. I understand where they come from. But many of us, man, it's, it is the biggest part of our pie. We love to worship. John, sing five more songs. And many of you are singing, hey, can we just do one? Can we just do one? There, there's, 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 there's this, and now the, psalm, the psalms are filled with, hey, praise the Lord. Enter his gates of thanksgiving and in his court. I mean, you, we could go on and on and on about singing, about making music, about dancing, about, you know, all those things. So this is a very known part of worship, but it is, again, part of our worship. Paul many occasions, says, hey, sing to each other psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, encouraging one another, instructing one another, some translations. So this is not just an Old Testament thing. This is a part of our worship. We give our song, our heart in gratitude to him. Maybe it's service. A part of our, our, our life is our service. When we serve people, when we serve at the doors here at church or when you serve in the community in some way in the name of Jesus or around the world. That's a part of our worship. We serve and give not only of our money, but we give of our time, but not just with God, but our physical time. When we put together a half a million meals for uh, the Ukrainian people in, in, in the Poland area uh, last weekend, that was serving when you serve in children's ministry or, or student ministry or in grow ministry or connections here and, and greet and, and help people find seats and you know, whatever, it's all a part of worship. And then finally, our mission, everything we do in life, every, your job. You don't have that job just to make money. You have that job because you have a mission, and I have a mission. If you're an attorney, if you're a businessman or woman, if you're a nurse, if you're a teacher, if you're a construction worker, if you're a mechanic, if you're a farmer, if you, whatever you do, rancher, you, everything we do is a worship. So we do that, we make a business deal, and we don't lie about what our product can do because we're on mission. We don't exaggerate what our company can do for you because we're on mission, and that's a part of our worship. So when you put it all together, it's not just song or one or the other, it's Everything, everything. Now, there are two things about this worship. And the first one is recognition, and the second one is motivation. Let me talk about recognition just for a minute. I'm going to put the graphic back on the screen because the question is, in this story, in Luke chapter 19, the Pharisees did not recognize the need to worship. They didn't recognize Jesus as the reason why we're going to be set free from our sin. All that he had been laying the foundation for for three years, they did not and would not recognize. And, and, and listen, many of us, maybe it's a lack of teaching, maybe it's a lack of caring, but many of us, didn't, don't, we don't recognize that every part of our life is worship. The way you live on Friday night or Saturday is worship. That everything we are and everything that we have, it is worship. Do we recognize that that the time that we spend with the Lord is actually a part of our worship, that the money that we give is a part of our worship? And I think some of us are like, hey, you know, I'm going to, let's see, which one do I want to do? Which one? I'll do, which one's the easiest? right? And many of us will choose maybe service. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll volunteer. Man, you've, you've badgered us enough. I'll volunteer. And we miss the whole 
the, the whole purpose. Because it's not just, hey, we need you to come work with kids. We need you to worship. We need you to help in the student ministry. Those kids are crazy. Well, it, it's, it's, we need you to worship. Does this make sense? And, and some of us, man, we get to the song time, and it's like, man, I'm going to serve out there so I don't have to worship in here. I don't have to sing. Because the singing part is like, man, I don't know. And many of I know you come from different backgrounds. We all come from different backgrounds. A lot of us come from places that didn't worship like this. And so, man, our singers, they are, they, how do you, I mean, how do you do what they do? <laughs> Working. They're, you know what they're doing? They're trying to say, hey, guys, he's worthy. Would you sing? And many of us are like, I got my cup of coffee. And I'm not really into this singing thing. Our church, and I understand, maybe you're not used to that, but do you understand, we don't get to pick and choose what we want to do in our worship. And now, you may not have the gift of singing. And if you think you do, ask the person next to you, and we can <laughs> figure that out. But if you don't have the gift of singing, I totally understand it. I, I mean, I totally get that. It's like, it's not a big deal to you. Music is a huge part of our, my life. Love worship. Love music of all kinds. Some of you, not so much. It doesn't exempt you just because you don't particularly have the gift of song that you don't engage in singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs together making melodies in your heart to the Lord because you are grateful and you sing that over and over in the, in, the, in the Scripture. It says to worship the Lord like that, but many of us were just reserved in that way, and I just want you to loosen up and say, you know what, I may not be able to sing, but I can make a joyful noise. And many of that's a literal translation. But it's okay. We can at least sing, or maybe it's the, ooh, it's the money thing. You understand that it's not about the amount. It's, it's about the heart. And many of us, in the, when it comes to song, it, we, it's, John, it's not because I don't like singing. It's not because I don't like the Lord. It's just I'm not, I don't feel worthy to even do it because you don't know what I did this week. You don't know what I did last night. And, it, and, it, and that condemnation, can I just tell you, listen, when we have the opportunity to sing or when we have the opportunity to give or we have the opportunity to serve or, or be in, in his presence uh, on our own or be on mission, guys, you don't have to be perfect in this. Don't let your sin, don't let your, mis, mis, uh, your, your, your mistakes, don't, don't let that come between you and, and a chance to worship the Lord. Many of you are stingy because you grew up poor and you say, I'll never be poor. And one way that I do that is not giving my money away. To you. I don't know what you're going to do with it. I understand. But these things we have to give to the Lord because it's a part of our worship. When, when he says, hey, the rocks will cry out, listen, I don't want to be replaced by a rock. And listen, I love rocks. Love, love rocks. Love going to Sedona, Arizona. If you've ever been there, unbelievable. I love the Grand Canyon, my favorite place on earth. I've been there probably 25 times. Love it, filled with rocks, okay? But I don't want one of them to take my place, and I'm not just talking about singing, I'm talking about one of them take my place in this whole encompassing thing called worship in my life, offering up my life, everything I have, everything I am, everything that I can do, I give it to you, and that is a part of our worship. It's recognizing that this is part of the worship. Now, the second recognition, the second is motivation. What is our motive in worship? Now, listen, you gotta understand this first century group of people as they're following Jesus and he's teaching like nobody else has taught. He's working miracles nobody else has done. Just raised somebody from the dead. He's talking about the kingdom of God and establishing the kingdom of God. And they are misunderstanding. They're thinking, okay, Israel is going to be established once again. The throne of David, they were excited, and rightfully so, but they were misunderstanding. And their motive, and I'm not saying it's an evil motive, but their motive was, hey, whew, yes, 
He's going to do something for us. He's going to free us from Rome, and we will now be free from captivity or free from the taxes or free to worship or free to do whatever. We're going to, we're going to enjoy this. This is going to be a great, great time for us. But I, I just want us to step back just for a minute to understand before we judge them how sometimes we, and I'm saying me, sometimes have a motive when we worship. Sometimes our motive is, hey, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give this to you, Lord, I'm worth this check. Now I'm going to expect you to give some back. Now, will the Lord bless us for giving? Well, the Scripture is filled with that. Will the Lord bless us for singing? Well, all the, well, of course, it's filled with that. But our motive, listen, our motive is because you're worthy that I sing. You're, my, my motive when I give is because you have given all of this to me. And listen to me, listen to me. If he never does another thing for you, he's already done enough. So when we sing our songs, or when you give your money, or when you serve, or when you're on mission, or when you give your time and scripture and all that, you're doing that because he is already worthy. We don't, we don't need motivation. We already have the motivation. So, so when you think about worship, don't think, hey, God, hey, I need you to answer this prayer, and so I want you to remember, let me pull my giving record up so I can show it to you. Because I need this prayer answered. I need this, I'm gonna sing this song, and I want you to, Look at how hard I sing. I mean, these guys, man, how many know if you did this for five seconds, you'd be like out of breath. You couldn't even sing. I want you to see, Lord, I want you to go on planning center, and I want you to, I want you to see how many Sundays I've worked this year. And, and, and listen, I'm not, I'm not making fun, because I think we all do this. Lord, I don't know why this is happening to me. When we face challenge, and we face difficulty, many of us go back to our record. And then it kind of brings up the motive question. Well, why were you doing all this? Does this make sense? Now, again, don't misunderstand me. God is a good God. He is a good shepherd. And he wants to take care of you. He wants to take care of us. But we don't give and we don't sing and we don't serve because he will give us something. We do it because he's worthy. And Palm Sunday, I think a few of them miss that. And I think this Sunday, a few of us miss that. Two questions, two questions. Is there a recognition in our lives that Jesus is actually worthy of our worship? In other words, our whole life, not just a little bit, not just our singing, not just our giving, but our whole life. And are we motivated to worship to get something? Or... Do we worship because Jesus is worthy? I don't want rocks, trees, mountains, and I'm glad that they will. Wouldn't that be a sight? I mean, that'd be pretty cool. I've been to the sequoias in, in California and Yosemite, those massive, massive trees. That's gonna be a sight when they go, you know, doing their limbs and whatever. And is, is, the, is the rocks, or is there gonna be a mouth that opens? Crazy, isn't it? But I don't want one of them taking my place in, in our worship. So if there's one thing that we learn, there's many things we could learn, but one thing, this Palm Sunday, and as you think about Palm Sunday this week and leading up to Holy Week and Good Friday and the price that Jesus paid, the reason that we worship is because of what Jesus did. He's already done it. And so if he never does another thing for us in the next part of our life, he's done enough. Now, will he do something? Yes. He's a good God. But even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't answer that prayer the way you wanted him to answer that prayer, and you want to pull up your record of worship, so to speak, and, and you can do that. He accepted their worship. He told the religious leaders, he's like, hey, let them let worship. If they don't, the rocks are rolling. So don't get legalistic in this thing. Don't, I mean, understand that we all have, every once in a while, have a wrong motive for giving or a wrong motive for doing something for the Lord. 
We do that with each other. It's just a part of who we are. And so he accepts it. It's not like Jesus is just testing us at every, every little thing, saying, what's your heart look like? Oh, you, you, you got a wrong one. No, he accepts it. I'm just saying, when we think of Palm Sunday, when you think about worship, it's more than just what we do in this room. In fact, it's more what we do outside of this room with our lives, because it's an offering. It's a worship everything we are. The way we treat people. The way we live. So we're going to sing this song, not in a manipulation type of thing. It's not going to I don't think even the drums are playing. We're just going to, across all of our campuses, we're just going to sing this song. And it's, it's kind of a recognition that, God, if there's areas of my life that I'm not worshiping you, some of you know better. Some of you have been following the, long, the Lord a long time, and you know better. You've just been lazy in the serving. You've been lazy on mission. You've been lazy in giving. You've been lazy in saying. Some of us know better, and some of us don't. It's the first time you've ever heard anything like that. And you're like, whoa, I didn't. My whole life? That's weird. I thought it was just Sunday. It's everything. So when we sing this song, I'm not trying to manipulate you in, in anything. I just want you to sing it in, in a recognition that the only motivation is because you're worthy. And I want to build my life. I want to build my life on who you are. And the extension of my life is an extension of you to this world and I use it to worship you help my motives and I declare you are worthy I recognize you are worthy Lord as we sing this song together I pray that our hearts kind of line up maybe some wrong teaching that we've had over the years maybe some selfishness maybe some laziness maybe some complacency, whatever the case is, many of us fall into that. And it's not, it's no reason not to worship. Many, many of us, what we've done this week, we would be utterly humiliated if anybody knew. God, don't let that stop us from worshiping you. We're going to get up again. We're going to, today's a new day. And this is a new song. We're going to sing this song. And then Monday, we're going to get up and we're going to do it, try it again. And if we mess up, we're going to, we're going to continue to worship. We're just going to get up because that's, that's, that's what you've called us to do. None of us are going to do that in perfection. So as we sing, we recognize our need. We recognize what you've done. And our motivation is because you're worthy. So in our hearts, we sing this song to you as a recognition and a motivation because you're worthy. In Jesus' name I pray.